Good morning and welcome to the virtual Sunday service for the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Lake Norman. Our fellowship walks diverse paths to find meaning and purpose, but we are united by our belief in the inherent worth and dignity of all and the obligation to express our faith through acts of justice and compassion. We are an open and inclusive liberal faith community. My name is Harvey Winter. I've been a member of this congregation for two years. I'm now vice president of the congregation. I discovered uh, that I was a Unitarian Universalist about five years ago when I walked into a service in my old town, the town I came from, Chestertown, Maryland, which is a small 5,000 person uh, village and has written down its main street, Black Knives Matter. I'm proud of that. We now light the chalice and the words are, we light our flaming chalice to illuminate the world we seek in the search for truth. May we just and in justice, may we be loving. We're in for a treat today. I've heard our speech, it's terrific. I've heard our presentation, it's terrific. It's Blessings in the Jark by Jane McAllister's Pope. At a time when we are experiencing so many losses, big and small, global and personal, life-defining and life-ending, how can we nurture hope? How can we find light in the empty, dark void of loss? We will explore these questions through the lens of Jane's story and reflection. About Jane, Jane McAllister Pope was an editor and columnist at the Charlotte Observer for 37 years. She retired last year, but guess what? She was called back six months ago to help during the pandemic and she hasn't stopped helping since. She trained at the Shalem Institute as a spiritual director and works in that capacity with the clergy program at the Davison Center for the Professions. She has preached, led retreats, and taught classes on prayer and spirituality at several churches. Jane watches over her two toddler grandchildren several days a week and is a caregiver for the elderly with whom Carolina. She plays Celtic harp when she can, feeds cats at their command, and does housework when she must. I now turn the pulpit over to Jane. Good morning. I'm thankful for the opportunity to speak with you today, and I look forward to learning more about you and your fellowship in the Zoom call that follows. Pat suggested that I talk with you about my own story, but what I felt the times called for was a reflection on loss. So what are you are getting today is a deeply personal look at what I have learned about finding light in darkness. It may not be the most uplifting topic, but I promise that there is hope, there is joy, and there is life. Most of you are strangers to me but I can say one thing about each of you with certainty. Every one of you in the past six months has suffered a loss. That's because this has been a time defined by loss. I wouldn't be surprised if we, in the future, we look back on 2020 as the lost year. Think about it. Many lost their job, or their small business, or their savings. Students lost their classrooms. Residents of nursing homes and patients in hospitals lost the comforting hands of visitors. We lost our favorite entertainments, our nights out at restaurants or movies or live concerts, museums, festivals, graduations, reunions, sports, all gone, at least for a while. 
I suspect most of us lost sleep as we worried about the future. We lost peace of mind. We all lost the hugs and the face-to-face -face interactions that provide so much of the joy and meaning of life. And of course, lives were lost. So many lives. Thousands in the Charlotte area, hundreds of thousands nationwide, and more around the globe. And still, the pandemic persists. The West Coast is ablaze. Peaceful protesters are met with tear gas or worse. The hurricanes keep coming and political ads pollute the airwaves. We've lost our comfort zone, our sense of invulnerability. Superman, it seems, is really only Clark Kent and Clark lost his reporting job when the Daily Planet was bought by a hedge fund. Now he's feverish and coughing and has no health insurance. So at a time when we are experiencing so many losses, big and small, global and personal, life-defining and life-ending, how can we nurture hope? How can we find light in the empty, dark void of loss? A Greek Stoic philosopher said, nothing can be taken from us. There is nothing to lose. Inner peace begins when we stop saying of things, I have lost it, and instead say, it has been returned to where it came from. Well, that's, that's wise, and it's easy enough to say of a lost library book. But what of a lost parent? What of a lost dream? What of the loss of everything you thought you could count on? What are we to do in such a time of loss? Rage, crumble, grieve, despair, patiently endure? Or can we perhaps allow it to transform us as individuals and as a community? Here's a starting point. Recognizing the connection between loss and joy. The depth of a loss is measured by the joy we took in what was lost, or at least by the joy that we expected to take. The greater the joy, the more painful the loss. So they are entwined, great joy and great loss. Sometimes the joy is more enduring than we imagined. And sometimes the loss is not as lasting as we feared. My earliest memory is of joy and loss. I'm not sure exactly how old I was, but it was before kindergarten, I'm sure of that. I was playing alone in my backyard on a swing set, flying happily back and forth when something caught my eye. I hopped off the swing and looked up into a tree where golden light was coming through the canopy. It was not an unusual sight. Sunlight coming through leaves. But this time it was. This time I was awestruck. It was so beautiful I thought my eyes would explode. I felt this incredible sense of oneness with the tree, with the sun, with the breeze, with everything that is. It was an intensely sacred experience, although it was years before I had the words to describe it. And even now, the best I can do is to say, I saw love at the heart of the world. 
Then my mom came out of the house and ruined everything. It's time for your nap, she said. You're tired. No, I said. No, I'm not. But I couldn't say more than that because I didn't have words to describe what I had just seen. I knew I couldn't make her understand. All I could do was cry in frustration. And so, in a mother's understandable assertion of authority, this transcendent experience of beauty and oneness with all that is came to an abrupt end. I don't recall if I actually took a nap, but I do remember lying on my bed devastated because I wasn't sure if I'd ever experienced that indescribable unity again. I desperately wanted to hang on to it. I was afraid I'd forget. The memory didn't leave me though. And when it happened again, this time as a young teenager walking alone on a beach under a full moon, I recognized it. And eventually over the years, I was able to string together the occasional rare experiences like perfect gems into an amulet of meaning. In time, I learned how to sit in silence and listen to the heartbeat of God. I found an inner sanctuary that became a refuge in times of trouble. Over time, I found that when I lost something or someone that was dear to me, I could most reliably find peace and comfort with two movements looking out into beauty and looking in to that sacred center where eternity and humanity intersect. And there were losses, of course, so I got lots of practice in being resilient. A rapist broke into my apartment and took my sense of safety. Failed relationships took my happily ever afters. A bishop rejected my perceived call to ministry. Mental illness threatened to take my only child. And then Gary, my long sought husband, the man who played his fiddle with fiery passion, who laughed and sang and prayed, who delighted in working with developmentally disabled adults and disadvantaged children, who traveled often to the Cheyenne River Reservation to be with his impoverished Native American friends, who saw the face of God in bikers and misfits. Gary, whose love carried me through so many losses, fell ill with cancer, and died. That was an almost unbearable loss. He was only 49. We were going to grow old together. As comedian Gilda Radner, who was part of the original cast of Saturday Night Live, wrote after her terminal cancer was diagnosed. I wanted a perfect ending. Now I've learned the hard way that some poems don't rhyme and some stories don't have a clear beginning, middle, and end. Life is about not knowing, having to change, taking the moment and making the best of it without knowing what's going to happen next. Well, it was surely time to take the moment and make the best of it. But I not only felt loss, I felt lost. 
I didn't know who I was anymore. I couldn't get back to normal because there was no normal to get back to. Normal unraveled without Gary, even though I had lived more of my life without him than with him. So, I thought, what if I don't even try to get back to normal? What if I let go, accept the loss, let what is missing create a sacred void inside me? What if I let the pain pry open a crack in me, a crack that could allow a new and more intense light to shine through? Or maybe I could just numb the pain. And that's what I did. Relying on work and mindless TV and my numbing vice of choice, spider solitaire. One night I was engaging in spider solitaire and inertia took hold. And although I ached from tiredness, I sat there playing solitaire well past midnight. I knew that 6 a.m. would bring horrible regret, but I didn't care. I was numb. I wanted to be numb. Finally, I dragged myself away from the computer. All I wanted was to crawl off to bed, but I suddenly remembered that I hadn't closed the garage door and turned on the outside lights. It's a simple task, but one that I had a hard time remembering. Gary always took care of that, and he never forgot. So I stumbled out to the garage, flipped on the lights, but something in my numb, sleepy self suddenly protested. I felt a push, a nudge, a call. So I turned the lights back off and walked out into the night. The air was clear and bracing, but not cold. Moonlight poured a soft shine over freshly mown grass. Wind lifted my hair and my heart and set the trees to dancing. I stood in awe. And then a light flickered on, but not from any switch I controlled. A firefly lit up in one of the trees delighted and surprised me because I associate fireflies with dusk, not the middle of the night. I associated them with childhood joy, not grief. Then I saw another and another and dozens of tiny lamps winked amid the leaves, all alive, all dancing. The numbness fell away. I raised my arms and twirled around, joining the dance. Thank you, I said aloud. Thank you. Thank you for life. Thank you for the dance. Thank you for this moment. Thank you for this peaceful place, this beautiful night. Thank you for bullfrogs croaking and geese honking and fireflies flickering. Thank you for Gary. Thank you. There was no dogma in my litany, just an overwhelming sense of gratitude, of belonging, a sense of being alive and of brushing up against mystery. The infinite seemed close, just beyond my outstretched fingertips. Gary seemed close. I could almost feel his touch in the wind. And although it was night and I was 50 years old, suddenly I was that young girl gazing at the sunlight that touched leaves with glory. 
In both experiences, the beauty of nature opened my soul. As a child, it was pure serendipity. As a widow, it was a reminder of what I already knew and had claimed. We are part of a greater existence, and even loss can be a source of transformed life. Stephen Charleston is a Native American elder and an Episcopal bishop. They recently posted this on Facebook. We may be broken, those of us who have known loss, but if we have been shattered, we have also been restored. I believe I speak for many others when I say that one of the great blessings of a spiritual life is the opportunity for healing. I do not mean a miracle, although miracles do happen but rather a very simple form of healing that restores the mind and spirit so the body can be strengthened as well. Faith is a process of healing. It gives us peace of mind, a calm center, balanced relationships, openness to change, and a commitment to practice healthy ways of life. Faith is a vital tool in recovery, reconciliation, and restoration. It is an ancient therapy many of us have discovered. We become what we believe in. And what we believe in is life in all of its fullness and wonder. We've lost so much in this age of coronavirus. We've lost so much throughout our lives, and the losses just keep coming. It was only a year after Gary died when I lost my father. A few years later, my mother. And who can look at what is going on in the country today without fear that we are losing our nation's soul? Who can look at the hard science of climate change without fear that we are losing our planet and the very future of our species. We need the healing that Bishop Charleston wrote about. It will take a radical faith and the courage to love. Zoom can bridge the physical distance between our socially distanced selves, but love is what will bring us back together. Love can close the gaping wound of political combat. Love can enable us to lift up one another when hard times fall. Love can pull us out of ourselves, out of our own grief and misery. And that is one of the most powerful things that has been confirmed for me in the past six months. It's not enough to find our inner refuge and crawl into it. The hope we find there must be expressed in action. For some, that action is activism for a cause. For some, it is raising a family. For some, it is working for justice. For some, it is holding the hand of a dying woman. For some, it is finding solutions. For some, it is making music. For some, it is telling the stories of those who are never heard. For all of us, it involves seeing the need and saying yes to love. My advice to you in these uncertain times, look into the void, walk into the shadows, see what is there. There's no need to numb yourself to what is happening. If it starts to overwhelm you, seek out beauty in nature, but also in art, in music, and rest in that beauty. Dare to lose who you think you are 
and be recreated out of chaos. Find inside yourself the light you seek. Look within, but realize that the light you find there is connected to the greater light, the greater love, the great mystery of the universe. Find and nurture that connection in whatever way speaks to your individual, unique soul. Find ways to embody that connection in service to others. Then you can face the turbulence of 2020 or any other year with resilience and hope. I'd like to close with a blessing from the Irish priest and poet John O'Donohue. It comes from his book, To Bless the Space Between Us, a book of blessings. And this is a blessing for absence. May you know that absence is alive with hidden presence, that nothing is ever lost or forgotten. May the absences in your life grow full of eternal echo. May you sense around you the secret elsewhere where the presences that have left you dwell. May you be generous in your embrace of loss. May the sore well of grief turn into a seamless flow of presence. May your compassion reach out to the ones we never hear from. May you have the courage to speak for the excluded ones. May you become the gracious and passionate subject of your own life. May you not disrespect your mystery through brittle words or false belonging. May you be embraced by God in whom dawn and twilight are one. May your longing inhabit its dreams within the great belonging. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. That was a wonderful and thoughtful message. I think it's appropriate now that we just take 10 seconds to let her message sink in.
visitor, welcome. We are so pleased you joined our virtual service. If you like what you've heard so far and are wondering how to stay connected or get involved with our congregation, please reach out to our membership chair, Linda. Her email address can be found at the bottom of the screen. And sometime next week, you'll be able to connect with us uh, on our new website. For those of you who have Jewish roots, Happy New Year. And for those of you who have Jewish friends, the thing to say is Shona Tova, which is a way of saying Happy New Year. I think the most important announcement I'm going to make today uh, is one we didn't publicize well enough uh, in our newsletter. And that is at 11 o'clock, we're having a talk back and a discussion with Jane Pope. If you look in your inbox, you're going to find a message that well, went out yesterday from the congregation. And there's a link there that you can press to join us at 11 o'clock. Um, what a wonderful opportunity to talk to Jane about what she said today and about other things you might want to uh, chat with her about. On another note, we're now ho hosting virtual cocktail parties via Zoom every other Friday evening at 5. We had one last Friday, and you'll receive an email invitation with a link to the Zoom connection for the next cocktail party, which will be on October 2nd. For our members, we appreciate your keeping current on your pledges so that we'll be able to resume full speed when we, when we start again in January. Um, in a, in next week, when the, the website goes live, you'll be able to make your pledges uh, via PayPal, so you won't even have to waste the stamp or use a stamp. We encourage members to continue reaching out to one another whenever possible. Keep posting book or movie clubs. Meet virtually for discussions. It's important we make that extra effort to sustain the deep bonds our community has formed. In that regard, I hope to see you all at 11. And for now, let's go forth and live our lives with integrity and with hope. And now, blowing out the chariot and saying, blessed day. Mm -hmm.